one. It is Wednesday afternoon, October 7th, and we are picking up in our study. Overall, our study is on the key players of the tribulation period and what rolls out in God's eternal plan up into eternity future. But last week at the end of class, we came up with a question about the first resurrection. So I said that I would bring the answer to that because it's not something that could be answered in, in one minute to this class. So we want to look at what is met, meant <laughs> by the first resurrection. Um, I should have looked up where we were reading that from. I jumped in and I didn't think to until this moment, but we know that it refers to um, the second death. It refers to a second time um, why we're calling this the first resurrection. I think we can just still jump in. We'll probably come across it as we're studying. But let me give you that uh, the, the first resurrection <clears throat> is not just a one moment in time occurrence. We're going to see that it has three phases. And before that totally blows you out of the water, let me remind you that everybody refers to the Battle of Armageddon, thinks that's one battle fought in one location. And when you study the scripture, you'll see really that there's four strategic places and four major battles that all converge under the title of Armageddon. One being in Har Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo, where we get the name Armageddon. But it's more conclusive than just that one spot. Well, the first resurrection is that same way also. We think, oh, it's going to be just one resurrection, but we have to look at Scripture and see that really it happened or happens in phases. Let me give you, um, let's, let's read first and then I'll give you what I wanted to say. Go with me right now to 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, I'm, I'm there. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15. And <clears throat> we're going to look first at verse 20. Because this has a key phrase for us in our, in our first resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 says, But now Messiah, or now Christ, has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah Christ all will be made alive. Okay, let me read verse 23 also. But each in his own order. Christ is the first fruits. After that, those are Christ, who are Christ at his coming. Okay, so we see right there that we've got two parts to this. We've got Christ being the first fruits, the first raised from the dead, the first resurrection. And then we see that all that are his are going to be made alive at another point in time. The fact that he brings in Adam here is why Yeshua Jesus had to put on human form to uh, be able to purchase life for us in human form. It took, Adam brought it in, brought death in, it took man to erase the, the second death, erase death for us in the power of the resurrection. I said that very poorly, but I think you all know what I'm referring to. Did you notice a key word in the beginning though in verse 20? We have that Messiah is the first fruits. Now if you've been with me enough in our Jewish festivals, you know there are a number of times through the year that we have first fruits. Again, we can see how we can be talking about phases here, even just by virtue of that name. First fruits is what's first brought in. When, when you plant a, a crop, you have the early ripening. That's brought in and brought to the Lord, given to him first. That's the first fruits. And that, in essence, is a faith-giving sacrifice on the basis of what you expect to receive. That you're bringing into the Lord, you're saying, I'm giving to you first, but there's a, a harvest coming. This is just a sample of it. So if we keep that in mind and we look at first fruits in the <clears throat> physical world, we see that we have those first fruits. Then we do have the harvest. We go on, the crop continues to grow, it all comes to that point that it's ripe, and the whole harvest, the whole crop, the whole field is harvested. That's the lion's share of it. But then, after that harvesting, we still have the gleanings. The gleanings are two parts. They are what the uh, workers left behind in the field for Ruth when she was 
um, able to glean from the field. It was to provide for the poor. We know that in Scripture. But it, it was... Uh, it was being harvested at the same time, but not gathered in at that moment. And we know that, it, as is true, if anybody's done any kind of crop or even had fruit on a tree, you have your early fruit, you have the majority of the fruit that comes out once, and then you have those few little stragglers. Those few little stragglers are part of the gleanings. So we see those three phases. Now, let me take this into what we're talking about. When we say that Messiah is the first fruits, then that would mean that he's the first to raise from the dead. Then there's going to be a majority, and then there's going to be some residuals still coming. Okay, do we see that in scripture? Well, let's look at different uh, scriptures. We've got our first fruits. Let's go to Matthew 27 and see also the first fruits there, because that's going to talk to us about um, the time of Messiah's crucifixion. But at the same time, we're going to see it goes a little beyond Messiah. This is Matthew 27, and this is verse 50. Okay? Um, I'm sorry, let's start with 51. 50, we have Messiah dying on the cross. Okay? In chapter, I mean in verse 51, chapter 27 of Matthew, Mattathiah, we have, Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Now we know that had I read verse 50, we have Yeshua had cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. We know that's the moment of his death. At the moment of his death, we know that that veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn in two from the top to the bottom. So we know that was the hand of God that ripped open that veil to show that the way into his presence, the way into the holy of holies was now made open for all to come in through the shed blood of Yeshua. Now look what happened around. Around, there, there was an earthquake. It was so severe that the rocks were split. What else happened besides the rock splitting? Verse 52, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints, that's believers, who had fallen asleep were raised. Okay? <clears throat> what we have happen here, um, let me read you verse 53, because this is key. Coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection. They entered the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and they appeared to many. So literally, you've got dead men walking. They've been brought back from the dead. They resurrected. They came up out of the tombs after Messiah came up out of his tomb. He is the first fruits. The tombs were opened at that earthquake, but nothing came out. They did not come out until after Messiah our first fruits had raised from the dead. So they came out, they went into the city in Jerusalem, they came knocking on the doors. They presented themselves to people who would know them. That was proof of the resurrection of Messiah because how did they resurrect but in the power that, that Yeshua, uh, Jesus first resurrected in the power from the, the Holy Spirit, from very God himself. So you have a sample here of some believers being raised from the dead, okay? Now, I don't believe that all of the graves were open and all the dead who believed through all time up to this point were that their graves were open. That's not what it's telling us. It's telling us in a location, in Yerushalayim. And I think that for fact of the purpose of why they came up to be that eyewitness, well, not the eyewitness, but to be the witness of the power of the resurrection, I think it had to be people that were recently um, buried there, that people in that area would have known. They, you know, if someone came to my door that lived a hundred years ago, I would not know who they are. And, and they can say who they are, and I think they're Meshuggah. Woohoo, you know. I would think we need to call the men in little white jackets and, and put them away for their safety. So who came to, to these, the others that were alive would be people that they knew. And that, that would attest to the resurrection. They would know, hey, I attended your funeral. I saw them lay your body in the grave. You're standing here alive before me. Wow. That would be a miraculous testimony to the power of the resurrection. So Messiah raised first, and then these others were like first fruits. They were a sample because, again, I believe there were many that had departed in faith 
prior to this date and in locations other than Jerusalem that did not raise at that point in time. Now, we've got our first fruits. We're going to go to our harvest. We're going to go to wheat. The field has been ripe now, and it is ready to be harvested, and we're going to bring in the great amount, the majority of what our harvest is going to be. Where would we find that for our, our fruit in our scripture? Well, if you're with me, and I can see some are puzzled and trying to figure it, but I think as I share it, you'll say, oh, okay, I get it. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and if you're familiar with this scripture, you know as soon as I give you that chapter, that this is the chapter that speaks to us of what we call the rapture. We don't find that word in scripture, we find it called the departure, we find it called the snatching away. Uh, there are different words that are given to it, but in our vernacular today, we refer to it as the rapture. So this is where if we start with verse 13, we know that we've got people that are grieving at the graveside of those that have uh, passed away that were believers. The ones that are standing at their graves that are, are crying and grieving are also believers. And Shaul Paul, the author of 1 Thessalonians, writing to the Thessaloniki people who are experiencing this loss of a loved one, even as we heard and prayed for someone today, then we, we read that, um, that these words that are of great comfort. What we read is that, verse 14, if we believe Yeshua, Jesus, died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now, falling asleep was a nice euphemism. It was sounded a whole lot softer to the ear than to say those who had died or those who were dead. But basically, that's what it's saying. So now we're being told that there is a time when those who have fallen asleep, those who have passed away, who were in faith believing, they're going to be raised. God's going to bring them with him. Now, if I could go back about 2,000 years... In fact, i got to go back further than that. If I look at my Hebrew calendar, I know man is almost 6,000 years old. And I know that all the way back in the beginning, we had people who had faith. We, one of the greatest, the father of our faith, we call him, is Avraham. Avraham was, oh my goodness, 5,000 plus years ago, okay, from now. So what my point is, is if we've got all these years and all this time, we have a great multitude of people who have died in the faith. If these are the ones that have fallen asleep that Yeshua is bringing with him, we're going way, way back. Now, that may be true, and I'm going to put in an if in here. If it's only referring to those in the age of the grace period, what we are in now, then I only go back about... 2,000 years. I'm going back to the time that the church began. Even if I only go back to that time, if this is referring just to the church age saints that died in their faith, then I'm still going back long enough. We have a large number in 2,000 years. In my humble opinion, I kind of tend to think that might be the more accurate, and I'll show you why later that those who, who died before the age of grace were going to see a resurrected at a different time. But I can't be dogmatic. It's just the idea that we get from the way Scripture words it. Either way, we've either got 2,000 years worth of believers that have passed away, or we've got 5,000 plus years. Okay. Either way, we've got a large, large number. We've got a harvest here, but it doesn't stop there because we've got to see the whole picture. Okay. So we drop down to verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay? Now we know for a fact, if it's talking about just the, the age of grace, the church age, the dead in Christ during that age raise first, and then we who are alive and remain are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, then we know we've got that great gathering together that we call the rapture. And obviously at that time, there's going to be a whole harvest of souls raised from the dead. Among them would be my parents who have gone on to heaven before me. And you're saying, well, how can you say that? Wait a minute, you just told me they're in the grave. <laughs> the soul, the real you, 
when you shed the, the shell, when you leave this earth and that shell doesn't go with you, then the spirit has gone ahead into the, the presence of the Lord because Sha'ol Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But that body that they shelled out of is in the grave. I'm trying to think if I can remember or um, and I can't. I wish I'd known. I'll bring another time. Adrian Rogers does a cute little poem and I love it, but I can't quite pull it back in my mind right now. Anyway, it's that body that's in the grave. And even if it has disintegrated over time, the God who created us out of the dust of the earth is more than able to bring back that body. And apparently he does because it says that the dead in Christ will rise first. And we know that that can only be speaking of that body because they are not soul sleeping. Their soul is always awake and alive. The soul doesn't sleep. The soul is what God breathed in. It became a living being and it, it, as long as God breathed in, you can't stop that. So it's that soul that goes either into the presence of the Lord or goes into uh, an, an eternal separation away from the Lord depending on what they did with his shed blood. So we've got the dead, we've got them raising, and by the way, just to finish it off, we'll, in fact, um, where are we? We're, let's go to it. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15, and let me show you how I get... And it didn't go there. Okay. Let me show you how I get this about the bodies being changed at this point in time and, and not before. 1 Corinthians 15, and I want verse 52, but I may have to start just ahead of it to give you the whole thought. But scroll down to somewhere close to... Um, okay, let's start with verse 51. Shaul Paul, same author as um, the Thessalonians, writing to the Thessalonians writes, Behold, I tell you a mystery. That means something that hasn't been explained before, something that, that's been kept hidden. We will not all sleep. Remember our euphemism? We will not all die. But we all will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trip, the trunk will sound and the dead will be raised. If we read it in First Thessalonians 4, I think we did. Maybe we did read that the trumpet blows. The shofar, God's shofar blows, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So when that body is raised up out of that grave, meets its spirit that's been with the Lord, is at that moment that it turns into imperishable. That means it doesn't perish, it doesn't die. They will live in that new body forever. At the same moment, those of us who are alive have been caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and also our bodies, without going through the death process, as we talked about last week, see that not everyone will die, but those who are alive in the day of the Lord's return will be caught up alive, and yet at that very moment that we're being caught up with the dead in Christ and their bodies are being changed into imperishable, our bodies also are. Because it tells us, verse 53, this perishable must put on imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal has put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, <coughs> death is swallowed up in victory. See, right now we deal with death. It's a very present reality in our lives. But at this moment in time, when we have been caught up to meet the Lord in the air, when the dead who, who died before us are caught up at that moment also, all of us changed into imperishable, into immortality, we will no longer taste death. It is gone, it is more than buried, and it is forgotten. The sting of death, which is sin, is gone forever. Verse 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your strength, your sting? sting. <laughs> Forgive me, your sting. Okay, so we have a beautiful picture of the dead being raised. The first resurrection second phase. Okay, remember we had the first fruits when Messiah raised from the dead first and then those who lived in Jerusalem that were that came out of the tombs at that time after his resurrection. Now we've got that big harvest of the whole field being ripe and ready and that were harvested. And then we're going to look, go all the way with me because we're not getting there in a hurry with our study, but we will get there. Go with me to Revelation 20 and verse 4. 
Revelation 20 speaks to us of the millennial reign of Messiah. We know that the tribulation has gone through chapter 19. In chapter 19 we have the Lord return in his glory, King of kings, Lord of lords, slays the, the false prophet and uh, the Antichrist, that he casts them into hell. We'll look at that, but there's their end, but we'll look at that when we come to that in our study. And then we move into the time where he set, the Lord sets up his throne on earth, fulfilling the promises that he gave to David, the promises he gave to Israel, that there would be one who sits on the throne of David, who rules from Jerusalem, who makes Israel the head nation, who is where all the other nations have to come up to Israel, make their uh, offerings unto the Lord, that their nation might experience rain, that it might have blessing for crops, that they might have food to eat, etc., etc. This takes place during the millennial reign. Verse 20, I'm sorry, verse 4 of chapter 20 says, Then I saw thrones. They that sat on them, judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, Yeshua, because of the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast or his image. They had not received the mark on their forehead and in their hand, and they came to life, and they reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. Well, I think this description makes it very clear. I don't think anybody would argue with me that this is those who lived through the tribulation period of time, because they're the ones dealing with being beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the Word of God. You could say, well, some have been beheaded today for that. True, but let me go one step further. Those who have not worshipped the beast or his image. We know that's the Antichrist and that's the image put in the temple. That hasn't happened yet. Some might want to say, well, that's what Antiochus Epiphanes did. Okay, he was a foreshadowing, but it wasn't the complete fulfilling because here comes our next layer. And have not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. Now we know, unequivocally, we are talking about tribulation saints. We're talking about those who lived the during the time during that, that time. yes, they are the martyrs, mm -hmm. that they did not take his mark and they, they lost their earthly life for it. But notice, do they stay dead forever? No. Yeah. Were they in the rapture? No, because they hadn't even been saved yet and they hadn't lived through the tribulation yet. So now when it says that they came to life, they reigned with Messiah Christ for a thousand years, then obviously we have a third phase of the first resurrection. We have now those who were raised first Messiah, and then those raised at the time, the majority who will go at the time of the age of grace ending, when we are caught up in rapture to be with the Lord forever, and then there's a period of time, seven years, during that time people get saved, and because of their faith, they don't take the mark of the beast, and they lose their lives. They are going to be raised so that they can reign with Messiah in the Millennial Kingdom that we're talking about here in chapter 20. So I think we see very clearly from these um, verses that we have three phases of the first resurrection. And we are even told in verse... Yeah, verse 5, I read you through 4, verse 5, chapter 20, the rest of the dead, okay, the ones that, that were raised were the ones who were martyred, we just read that in verse 4, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed, okay, the whole millennium has to be completed, and it says, this is the first resurrection, that's in my mind as if it's putting a, a Stop now, okay? We have all these who've been resurrected at three different times. They're all part of what's called the first resurrection. And here's the verse I was looking for. Revelation 25 refers to it as the first resurrection. Then notice something very important in verse 6 of chapter 20. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Okay, all those people, whether they were in phase 1, 2, or 3, they are blessed and they are seen as holy. They're part of that first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. Okay? Second death. But wait a minute. It's appointed that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. What does it mean by second death? Well, the same way that this resurrection is talking about their spiritual condition, the second death is talking about their spiritual condition. <coughs> Throughout time. to the lost. 
It's applying to the lost. Pam got it. Through the age of man, people have continually died not in faith. Did not trust the Lord as their Savior. Didn't look forward to the cross. Or if they lived from the cross time after, didn't look back to the cross as we do today. They died in their sins. They died without salvation. As uh, I think, I, I like to give credit where it's due. I think it was Adrian Rogers said, you can either be born twice and die once, or you die twice because you're only born once. What we're talking about is spiritual birth. If you are born again spiritually, the second death, this death that is being talked about doesn't touch you. You have that eternally, forever. You don't die spiritually. But if you never receive that, that born again life, then you die physically and you die spiritually. And we see that all the way back with Adam and with Eve. When they first sinned in the garden, it is said that dying, they will die. Immediately they died spiritually. Immediately they're in need of a sacrifice. That's why the Lord provides for them a sacrifice. Shed blood right there in the very beginning, pointing to what he would one day be, the Lamb of God shedding his blood for the world. So immediately we see they needed a sacrifice. But do we see Adam and Eve living on the face of this earth today? Do we have an almost 6,000-year-old man walking around? <laughs> of course not. So obviously they died immediately spiritually, but the physical death started setting into the body. And we know that eventually Adam and Eve passed away. And all the other people have come since the same way. So when we talk about a second death, we're talking about the spiritual death that they've already died physically, they will die spiritually. In the second death, there is no return. They're, they're, they've stood before God for judgment, and we will see, when we get to that state, we will see they're cast into, uh, it, it, well into hell. They're in eternity forever apart from the Lord. Mm -hmm. So, that is our study on the phases of the first resurrection. It gives us, all the way from the first man, to the very last, we see the phases of the resurrection. Actually, for the, the resurrection, it will end at millennial time because there'll be those that reign then. And by the way, that's my point. Also, when we look at the um, Old Testament saints, as they're call, called, when we look at them, it could be that they are part of this phase also. In fact, I don't have the verse here. I thought I did have it. Um, where we think that they may be raised at this time because it seems to be talking in the in Thessalonians to the church age. Let me come back with that part of it. I don't remember where the verse is that gives us the idea that we look at. I'm looking through my notes real quickly to see, um, and I'm not finding it, where we get the idea um, that, that the rapture is speaking to the church age and that um, just the same way and I guess maybe it's just the conclusion that we come to rather than a verse because no verse is coming to my mind we know that God in essence has his plan with Israel all through time that the age of grace on our charts like a parenthesis that he's dealing with us as a quote Gentile people provoking the Jews to jealousy that they might pick up what they lost and come into saving faith that they do they're part of this you know whether you're Jewish or Gentile you can be part of the age of grace but when we are raptured and God goes on with his plan with Israel we see the continuation of God's initial plan they're going to go back to the sacrificial system we see how it continues on through the tribulation period and in essence that's where we're seeing that possibly those Old Testament saints that are not part of this time are still um, not resurrected to rule and reign until the thousand years of ruling and reigning with the Lord is given at that point in time. We can argue that on both sides. Um, doesn't matter to me whether you believe that Old Testament saints are resurrected at rapture or at the time of his second coming. It's not a point that we need to split over. Um, but again, I just, still there's a verse that I'm wanting to remember, and it's not coming to mind. Second Let, Thessalonians? Second Thessalonians? Give me the chapter verse. Yeah. No, so oh. that, that's not talking about their being resurrected, though. Second Thessalonians 2 is talking about um, us going up and then right. the Antichrist being revealed. Okay. 
But uh, let me get you, Rowena, in one second. Let me bring you Daniel. Daniel 12 does make this clear, and Daniel is prior to church age, okay, prior to the age of grace. Daniel 12 and verse 2 says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. There's your two, the resurrection of the saved, and then you have the timeline that goes on, the resurrection of the unsaved that will be at the end of time when they stand before God at the great white throne judgment. And we go into, we're headed right into eternity future at that point. So here's where we see, some are raised to an eternal life with the Lord, some are raised to an eternal damnation apart from the Lord that they've brought on themselves. But that still doesn't hit on the Old Testament saints. It'll come back to my mind, I'm, I'm just spinning. Rowena, unmute yourself. She's trying. Roger's trying to. There we go. You you were teaching us before about the two parts of Shoal. Yes. And then you you mentioned before that when Christ uh, died, he visited Paradise Side and took with him the saints. So these yes. are the Old Testament saints. Yes, they would not be. They would be in in the presence of the Lord. Um, Okay, but still, and if, you know, that that gives credence to saying that's when rather than at millennium, because they would be like the dead in Christ that he's referring to. That body was in the grave, but their spirit, yes. Good point, good point, and I think you just settled it for me, Rowena. Um, I know I'm spinning too fast. I appreciate your focus. Um, what she's reminding me, remember how I took us through, that we see that after the Lord put his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, that he took the booty that he had won. He took through Satan's parameters, and he took them right into the very presence of heaven, because otherwise Paul couldn't say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If we still went into Sheol, into the heart of the earth, into the paradise side, if that's where it still was, then we'd all be going down there, and the Lord, we know, is not in the heart of the earth. We know he's at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. We have that all the way through in Revelation. We see him in heaven. So we know that the paradise side was emptied out. And yes, that would be your Old Testament believers that, that were emptied out. So they are in heaven in the same way that those who died today are in heaven with that intermittent body. They're not just a woohoo spirit floating around. They, they, they're tangible. Um, but their body meets them in the air and they're changed into that final permanent new body that we're told that when we will be like Christ. So yeah, I would say that puts us with our Old Testament saints resurrecting um, in the midst of the dead in Christ rising first um, at time of rapture at our main harvest. That's a good point. Thank you, Rowena. Any other questions, comments? Was I clear as mud? Are we scratching our heads? <laughs> Are we good? <laughs> Okay, my audience here, are we good? Yep. Okay, okay, all right. Um, Roger, is there any way to get air movement at all? Something I can do that won't interfere with the, uh, sorry, but I'm frying, and if I'm frying, you guys gotta be warm, but I'm frying. <laughs> um, while he's making that quick change, we will make our change, and we'll go back to our key players of the tribulation. And we are picking up today in Revelation chapter 12. So those of you who want to follow in scripture, go to Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to talk about the woman of Revelation 12 and identifying who she is. Okay? I'll bring you other views, but I'll make it very clear why I believe there is no other view, that there's only Seven one right answer. View. <laughs> Doesn't matter who's saying it, that we've got to see it in scripture and... Uh, that the right answer is the scriptural answer, and I believe that we can identify without any problem. Uh, because again, there's a lot of description, a lot to make it clear. So, um, you said 12? Revelation chapter 12. Okay? Revelation 12. One. We're going to start with verse 1. Revelation 12 and verse 1. Okay. Sorry, I don't know if it's because I've moved to this corner and, and, and it's worse. I don't know, but... I, You're going to want my fan. No, it's okay, because he's doing something, so... Um, Roger, okay if I go ahead? Okay, is that too noisy? He got a fan on. Is that too noisy? 
Anyone have trouble hearing now? Okay, very good. If it changes, give me the frantic, you know, let me know, ear or something, okay? And it, I think it'll help everybody else here too. So, all right. Revelation 12, verse 1 tells us a great sign. This is something, you know, that, that's a phenomenon, okay? In Revelation, we've got seven signs that are great signs. This is the first one that we're going to talk about. What is it? This great sign that appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, when we know that it's a sign, we know that it's a symbol, it's an object lesson, it's telling us something greater. In other words, we don't have a real woman in heaven who is clothed with the sun, the moon's under her feet, and she's got 12 stars around her head, and she's superwoman or something. <laughs> this is all symbolic language. This is to explain something to us. Notice the sign is in heaven, okay? Um, now, what the woman is going to symbolize is on earth. The, we're seeing it in heaven, but it's got an earthly explanation to it, okay? Um, if we follow, if we just keep reading, then I think we'll begin to get more of a description that will help us know who is this woman. Thank you very much. That's much better, Roger. Okay. This woman in verse 2, well, first of all, okay, let me give you, because maybe it'll make it more clear, let me give you um, who this woman is not. <coughs> that way you don't go down a rabbit trail the wrong way, okay? There are those who want to say that this woman is the church. She is not a picture of the church, okay? We're going to see that on the basis of verses 2 and 5. And I'll tell you quickly what they're saying. 2, this woman is with child in labor. Verse 5 tells us that labor produced the male child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron who has been caught up to God and to his throne. Could anyone in any stretch of imagination say that's a description of the church? No. No. Okay, the church was not a male child. In fact, the church is referred to female in Scripture, but that's beside the point. The church is not going to rule the nations of the world, and furthermore, the church has never been caught up to God and to His throne right now. We know we will go up into heaven, but we will never sit on the throne with God. That's a love seat built for two. That's God the Father and God the Son, and no one else will ever sit there. Holy Spirit doesn't sit, okay? So it's not the church. It is also not Mary, or in our Hebrew, Miriam. There are those who tried to say, oh, this is the one who gave birth to Messiah. We see that. This, this birth is obviously Messiah. So why are you so adamant that it's not Mary? Because maybe it should be Mary. She gives birth to the church. Well, let's look what else that happens with this woman. In verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. Okay, now you say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember back in Sunday school, they taught me Mary and Joseph fled. They ran right after Jesus was born. This is the woman fleeing in the wilderness. Well, we have a problem. In Yeshua, Jesus' birth time, Miriam and Yosef fled into Egypt. They didn't go into a wilderness like is what it will be described here. Um, we're going to see that that wilderness is a place prepared by God where he nourishes her for three and a half years, 12, 1,260 days. Okay, my air just finally circulated. Again, I'm questioning to make sure everyone on Zoom, can you still hear without interference? Good. Okay, we got a good connection today. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so... First of all, she fled into Egypt, Mary did, Miriam, Mary, did not to the wilderness, and she fled there for her child's safety, not for hers, okay? Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, when the dragon saw he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman. So we have the woman fleeing for her sake, not for her child's sake. Why did Miriam and Yosef flee? They fled for the, the child's sake. Because Herod's throw, going to throw out that net to kill all the male babies two years and under, which would catch Yeshua Jesus in that net had they stayed in the land of Israel. So Miriam and Yosef, Mary and Joseph, fled for the sake of their child. 
here in Revelation, the fleeing is for the sake of the woman. The woman is who is being persecuted. The woman is fleeing for her own safety. And we read that it was before the child was, uh, wait a minute, let me say this right, okay. Verses five and six, when we go back there, okay. The child's caught up to God and to his throne before the woman flees. Now, you've got a real problem if you can figure out how to do that with Mary and Joseph. <laughs> it just can't go in that order. They didn't flee afterward. I mean, they, you know, Mary gave birth and then they fled. And here it's, we're seeing that before the child, I'm saying it wrong, I'm really backward today. I think you got my point, okay? It's the opposite. We're gonna go through it so you'll see it when we go through it better if you didn't catch it this time. So if the woman is not the church, the woman is not Mary. Who are we left with? We know that sometimes we see Israel described in this way in Scripture. Let me show you that, and let's see if that fits, okay? So let's go to Romans 9. Um, keep Revelation 12. We're coming back. Go to Romans 9, and we're going to look at verse 5. Romans 9 and verse 5. Okay? That says, um, Whose are the fathers? And from whom is the, the Messiah, according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Okay, from the end of that, obviously, you know that we're talking about Messiah. We're talking about the Christ child, okay? So let's go back now earlier in, in chapter 9 and see what we're talking about so that we can understand. It says, I'm telling the truth in Messiah. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Paul has just called in for witness, Messiah himself, and the Holy Spirit, okay? That great sorrow unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish I, I would even be a curse, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who's Paul's brother? Who's, who's his kinsman according to the flesh that he is so burdened for that he's saying, if I could even be separated from Messiah for their sake, I would be. Who's he talking about? Is he talking about his immediate brother and sister who we don't even know about in Scripture? Jewish, Jewish. Very good. Pam got it. He's talking about the Jewish people. He's talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about the, the, the race because verse 4 tells us, uh, we just ended with my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites. I think that makes it very clear. To whom belongs the adoption of sons, the glory of the covenants. Who had the covenants? Israel. The giving of the law. Israel, the temple service, Israel, the promises, Israel. We've talked about how the millennial time is a time of fulfilling the promises God made to Israel. So obviously we see that it's talking about Israel. When we come now into verse 5, whose are the fathers? Who's the fathers? Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These are the fathers of Israel. And from whom is Messiah according to the flesh? What that saying is, if Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, if all of these, and if the, um, the race called Israelites, if that's who we're talking about, we're saying that that's who is the lineage of Messiah, of Christ. So he's born of Jewish blood. So Israel gave birth to Messiah in that way. Did she literally? No. Miriam, Mary literally gave the, the birth, but we are talking in that general, we know that Messiah was born to Israel. He's Jewish. He's of their flesh. They're his kinsmen. Yes, Roger. Roger, what's going on verse? Uh, I'm sorry, that was, I read, I backed up to verse 1 in chapter 9 of Romans. I just read Romans 9, 1 through 5. So, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, so we've got very Jewish language here. We've got this symbolical view of Israel in her glory here when we talk about Israel ruling the nations, okay? Um, where did we read that? I guess we read that back in Revelation where we came from. Um, but we do know. We know that Israel will be the head nation and the other nations will come up to Israel. We've just talked about that. So what we're seeing is the promises of the kingdom age that were given to Israel. In other words, Egypt's not going to be a head nation in the millennial time. Egypt will be a real nation still, but they're not going to be a head nation. 
They're going to have to come up to Israel, come up to the temple, do what they're supposed to do, and then God will bless their land with rain. Okay? So, let's see this from before our, our church age. Okay? Let's take it back all the way back. Let's go to Bereshit, to Genesis chapter 37. And in Genesis chapter 37, verses 8 through 11, we have um, the point of what I want to say, but again, let me back up. Back up to verse 5. Yosef had a dream. Now, that's Joseph in your English, and I've got to clarify right now. I've taught to you very recently of Miriam and Yosef. Mary and Joseph who gave birth to the Messiah in the flesh. When he was born of the house of David, he was born through Miriam. His earthly stepfather is Joseph. Is that the Joseph we're reading about now? I should see lots of heads going, and I don't see one head going. Am I losing everybody? <laughs> okay, good. Rhonda's head's going. <laughs> I, I see her head okay, going. we have Joseph, Yosef, in the, and I like better to say the original covenant because I like the fact that it doesn't sound like it's old and antiquated. Original covenant, we have a Joseph who lived then. We have a Joseph who lived in the first century AD. He was already alive when Yeshua Jesus was born. This Yosef is long buried. His bones have been taken back to Israel thousands of years before Yeshua Jesus was born, and that Yosef is being talked about. So, now that I've made that very clear, we're back in the time of Yaakov, of Jacob. Jacob, we know, had 12 sons. We call them the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? So keep that in mind when we're talking about the symbolism here. This is a Joseph we're talking about, the Yosef who had a dream. Now, when he told his dream to his brothers, the other 11 of them, they hated him all the more. And if you know the story, you know that Yosef was a favored son of Yaakov. His brothers didn't like that. They didn't like him. They didn't like his godliness either. And, in fact, we're told that, that um, they hated him. They were jealous. So, they were jealous. There was a jealousy. So, this is not going to float their boat, but we need to look at what this dream is that he had, okay? He says, listen to the dream that I had. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up, stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered round and bowed down to my sheep. Well, his brothers got it. They said, are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? And they hated him even the more for his dreams and for his words. Well, long story short, fast forward to when Yosef is second only to Pharaoh in the land of Egypt when there's a time of famine going on and his brothers went down to Egypt to get food, who did they bow down before? Their brother, Joseph. Right. They didn't know that's who it was. <laughs> Eventually they did come to know, right. but his words were prophetic and they were fulfilled. Okay, so now we know, we listen to what he had to say. Verse nine, still he had another dream. He related to his brothers. Now notice how this dream fits with Revelation 12. That's why I took you here, okay? I'm not just going off the beaten path. There's a reason why I brought you here. Lo, I had still another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father, his brothers. They rebuke him. And his father even said, your mother and I, we're going to bow down ourselves to the ground before you. And the brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. And we know that when we fast forward through time, the father's going to have a wonderful reunion with his son. No problem with his bowing down to his son at that time. But do you notice that he had this dream of the sun and the moon and the 11 stars all bowing down? What we are picking up here is that this is a picture of Israel. Remember, they all represented Israel. Now take that back to Revelation 12, and in Revelation 12, when you have the woman who's clothed with the sun, has the, the stars around her, how did it say it? I'm trying to say it quickly. Um, okay, clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, and they had a crown 12 stars, okay? So we're seeing 11 stars because Joseph is still telling the dream, but we're seeing language that is much the same. So we know that, that this is language that refers to Israel. If it refers to Israel in Genesis 37, 
it is very likely it refers to Israel in Revelation 12. The two relate. Okay. The stars are the tribes. The right. stars were a picture of the tribes. Yeah, the brothers, tribes. and they were they became tribes. Yes, yes. So you have your your twelve tribes that we have the hundred forty four thousand come out of. Those are the same ones. That's who we're talking about, and we know they're all Jewish. So there's your symbolism coming together. Now, I said earlier that. Um, Maybe I didn't say it earlier. Let me let me bring out to you also. Um, yeah, I think I still need to bring theology. this out. Uh, <laughs> Pam is saying bring so out replacement bad. theology, and, and it's bad. That I I don't want to sidetrack too long on it here, but if you don't know what that means, that means that the church has replaced Israel. The promise is given to Israel. Now go to the church. God's done with Israel. And the church gets all the promises. Mind you, the church never has to deal with all the curses that God promised That's also right. if they were obedient. Just the, promises. <laughs> just the promises they take. But no nowhere curses. in Scripture does God take back a promise. If He did anywhere, then we have to worry that He could take back the promise of our salvation. If He got done with the Jews when He said He never would, then He could get done with the believers when He said He never would. So, no, it's a lie out of the pit of hell. It is, it is not what we believe. But we can see that this is symbolic language talking about Israel. Let me also show you that often in Scripture, Israel is portrayed as a married woman. In the original covenant especially. Go with me to Isaiah, Yeshua, chapter 54. Isaiah 54. In Isaiah 54 and verse 1, we read, Shout for joy, O barren one, you have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. And when I drop this down to verses 5 through 7, we see who this is talking about. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel who is called the God of the earth, for the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she's rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. That's Israel's history right there. What we are seeing is that, that God is referring to Israel as his wife. Okay, now we have the church, the body of Christ, referred to as the bride of the Christ. But we have Israel referred to as the wife of Jehovah. If I put it that way, you can see the separation of the wife of God. And here he makes it very clear. Verse 6, the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit. And when he says that for a brief moment he forsook, what he's referring to is for that brief moment he held back the way that the salvation was through the, the nation of Israel to bring in the Gentiles, yeah, to bring in the Gentiles to provoke the Jewish people to pick that ball up, to not pass the ball of salvation, to not miss out. He doesn't forsake them as in, I'm done with them and they're gone, but he allows them to be provoked to jealousy. He adds in the Gentile child so that when they see the Gentile child getting love and devotion from their God, the God of Israel, they'll want their God back. They'll want his attention back, drawn back to them. And it works. It does provoke them to jealousy. And they do come to believe, thank God. I wish more did. Okay, so here we have, and let me give you a couple other places just to show you we don't build a, a belief on one scripture alone. Jeremiah... Um, 3 and verse 1. Go to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 1. God says, If a husband divorces his wife and she goes for it from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? Will not that land be completely polluted? But you are a harlot with many lovers, yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. He's calling Israel out. He's saying that you're not... Uh, this isn't a husband that divorces his wife, gets rid of his wife, and, and she goes off. No, you are like a harlot with many lovers. You keep forsaking me. You keep leaving me. But you do turn to me. You do come back. That's Israel's history. How is she a harlot? Is it literal? No, it's figurative. Harlotry is idolatry in this case. They went off worshiping other gods. They, they made a golden cap and said this brought them up out of Egypt. 
we see them repeatedly go after the gods of the other lands and yet they finally wake up and realize in their misery and they turn back to God who brings them back in because as he says he, you return to me he's faithful to them um, Hosea 2 1 to 5 Hosea's whole story God kept telling him to take her back take her back take her back why because he was using it as a picture of how he is with Israel um, chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 uh, I want to make this as easy as I can to understand. Say to your brothers, Ami, to your sisters, Ruma. Okay, we'll get what that means in a moment. Contend with your mother. Contend for she's not my wife, I'm not her husband. Let her put away her harlot tree from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, or I will strip her neck through and expose her on the day when she is born. I'll make her like a wilderness, make her like desert land, slay her with thirst. Also, I have no compassion on her children because they're the children of the heart of the tree, for their mother has played the harlot. She who can see them has acted shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers. Who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink? Do you hear rebellious Israel there? I'll go after these other gods. I'll go after the gods of my lovers. They're the ones that are giving me bread and water. They're the ones that, that are giving me the wool, the flax, the things to eat, the oil to drink. So they, were, they were cheating on God they like were man cheats on women. Yes, yeah, yes. They were cheating on God the way we see it. Well, Pam's saying the way a man cheats on women, but also a woman who is not faithful to her husband. Either way. Either way. And God makes it clear that they do this again and again and again and again. Yet we see he always brings them back. He told Hosea, bring her back, bring her back, take her back. She went off and cheated on Hosea. And God said, don't give up on her, bring her back, because he was using it as a picture. Lastly, let's look at Micah. Micah chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Micah chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Micah in our Hebrew, Micah in your English. Now, why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you, or has your counselor perished that agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth? Writhe and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion. That tells us he's talking to Israel, Jerusalem, like a woman in childbirth. From now on you will go out of the city, dwell in the field, go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. This is just one example. Israel, you are you're being unfaithful to me. You wanted a king. You wanted to be like the other nations. You didn't want God. You didn't want his prophets. Go on off. Go do your own thing. But you know what? You're going to end up in captivity by Babylon. You're going to go out from the city of Jerusalem. You're going to dwell in the field, and you're going to eventually end up in Babylon. That's where I'll rescue you. Why? Because when they were in Babylon, they finally cried out to their God. They cried out for his mercy. They came back to him, and he brings them back into the land of Israel. That is our God. So we see very often Israel is symbolized as the wife of Jehovah, where we don't confuse it with us being the bride of Christ um, in, in our age of grace. I think I've covered everything I need to say there. Now, I am not here to anathemize other religions, to, you know, I, that's not my point, but I have to say what I have to say. Roman Catholicism claims that the woman is Virgin Mary. We've shown how it's not Mary, that it does not fit. May, May, Mary <laughs> Baker Eddy, somebody forgot to silence their cell phone. I leave mine in the car now. <laughs> Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, declared that she was the woman of Revelation 12. And the religious system that's described is her Christian science. But again, the description is very clear. It matches Joseph's dream, Genesis 37, the woman is Israel. The 12 stars are his 10 brothers, and his father, and his mother. Later we see Jacob with his 12 sons, the 12 tribes that make up the nation of Israel. So, even though here are these other views, we see how they all fall flat. So we're left with nothing but to believe that this is the woman who we know is identified as Israel. Lord bless you, Kathy. Glad you made it for what you did. Okay. And are you okay on your own? Yeah, Anne's going to help you. Sorry, we've got someone that want to make sure she gets out the door without a, um, a, a fall.
So. Thank you, Anne. Okay, while that's going on, I'll go on then. Let's go back to Revelation 12. We're ready for it now. We've, we really have identified who this woman is. I think we've identified very clearly. She is clothed, okay? Verse 1, I'm still in verse 1, a woman clothed. Clothed, she is clothed in royal, regal, government, governmental splendor. She's arrayed similar to Joseph's dream, okay? She's not naked. She's clothed. She's brilliant. It's beautiful, okay? The sun speaks of the ultimate authority. When we think of the sun, we think of the gloriousness of the sun, the authority being greater, the moon we're going to see as a lesser. That is, is the glory of the victorious Messiah. When he was transfigured, he shined brighter than the sun. Okay, when he showed his glory to Moshe, he showed what was left behind, and it still almost blinded Moshe. So the, the sun being her clothing is that glory of a victorious Messiah over Israel. It's the glory of the new covenant made with Israel. Um, God has promised that new covenant to Israel. He promised her a future glory. Let me back up what I'm saying here. Let's jump back real quick to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31. And we'll start with verse 31. If anyone ever is, is sharing with Jewish people, they say there is no new covenant promised in the original. No, there is, and here it is. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, and we're going to start with verse 31. It makes it easy to remember. 31, 31. We read, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. When we had Israel divided, we had Israel and we had Judah. Ten northern tribes called Israel, two southern called Judah. That's why it's given both here, because it's talking about the whole of Israel. This covenant, this new covenant, it's not like the covenant, verse 32, which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke. Remember, it didn't take them long at all to break that covenant with God. They broke it, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, and we just saw how he is a husband to Israel, did we not? So we know that we're talking, the language is the same all the way through. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Okay, the new covenant, here it is. I will put my law within them. On their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He is going to make a covenant with the people with Israel where he's writing it not on tablets of stone like the old but he's going to write it on the tablet of their hearts then they, he will be their God and they will be his people and they will not teach again every man his neighbor and each man his brother saying know the Lord for they all will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity their sin I will remember no more now, is that a promise Israel has had fulfilled? Not fully. The new covenant has come. The new covenant we know is his shed blood. But the fulfillment where he has removed their iniquity and does not remember their sin anymore is what we will see come in millennial reign when he fulfills this fully to Israel. We could go on even through verse 38. Let me read it quickly because I don't want to ever have any room for any of you to slip into replacement theology as Pam brought out. Look at verse 35. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day, the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. Who does all that? Who's fixed the sun for the day, the moon and the stars for night, and makes the sea roar, the waves and all? The Lord of hosts, Adonai Sabaot, is his name. <coughs> Excuse me. If this fixed order departs from before me, if the sun, the moon, the stars, the waves of the sea, if that departs from me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. He just declared that Israel is his nation, the offspring before him, forever. And what's the proof of it? The sun, the moon, the stars, and the waves. Anybody see the sun today? I have. Did you see the beautiful moon last night? It's quite full. It's beautiful. Did you see stars? I did. I didn't see the waves. I didn't see the ocean. 
that I know it's there, I know it's still roaring, I know it's still tied, moving, coming and going. If it weren't, it'd be all over our news media. <laughs> so, as God has not made a full end of Israel, He is showing it by His these elements that He has fixed. That's what He's saying. And, uh, and I love even verse 37. If the heavens above could be measured, the foundations of the earth searched out before, then I'll cast off my offspring Israel for all they've done, says the Lord. I love that. Has heaven been measured by the scientists? No. Nope. Every time they think that they've about found the expanse of heaven, they find something else. And in our day and age, it comes to the point that they say they're black holes, that they have no idea how deep they are, how big they are, they can't measure them, and they know that our Milky Way is the Milky Way in the midst of how many more Milky Ways, how many more uh, black holes, black holes, universes was the word about black holes. All, we know that we have no idea the end. We cannot measure the heavens. We don't know. Can you get through the earth and get to the center and know the distance? We don't know where the center of the earth is. We don't know the foundations then of our own earth. And God has said that if those things can be measured, then he would let go of Israel. Behold, days are coming, verse 38 declares the Lord, when the city will be rebuilt for the Lord. From the Tower of Hananel to the Corner Gate, it goes on from there. We don't need to read on into those verses. You can for yourself on your own. But it's God's faithfulness. It's what God has promised. And God will fulfill every word that he says. So, we know this has got to be part of God's fulfillment then. We go now on our way back to um, Revelation. We're going to stop off at Isaiah first, so actually you have to go backward one more book. Yeshia, Isaiah comes before Jeremiah, and literally he came just a little before too, and they're within less than 100 years between each other. Um, in fact, I think there's some overlapping. Anyway. You know, they did say back in the replacement theology, they told me, you know, what well, says in there that God divorced them, you know, divorced the Jews, and and but like you said, it's it's not the same divorce that we have right. today. Right. It we, is not the complete cut off divorce that we have. In the same way that Hosea, his wife went out, was unfaithful, and God said, "Bring her back. Bring her back." In that same way, his divorce is that that saying where he said he forsakes her for a minute, a moment in time where he says, okay, because you're not faithful to me, I'm going to bring in these people, and when you see me show my love to them, hopefully it'll make you jealous so that you'll want back in. Mm -hmm. But he never denies them coming back in. Individually, continually, collectively, as the nation of Israel, they will come back in fully when he returns in his glory at second coming. When they say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, yes, and look at what he promised in chapter 60 of Yeshaya. Arise, shine, for your light has come. What's that light? The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness of peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear unto you. And I believe it's Isaiah chapter 9 that says that the people sat in darkness, and they saw a great light. Let me verify that I think that is chapter 9. And the, um, whoops, not zero, let's go to nine. Verses one and two, I believe. Verse two, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation, and it goes on, there'll be gladness in his presence. We know that light was Messiah coming to the nation of Israel. That they sat in darkness, but they saw a great light. That's why he said, I am, boy, that takes you right back to the burning bush. That takes you back to God's name with the nation of Israel. And I am the light. And it's the light for the world though, not just for Israel, but I am the light of the world. He is the one who brings the light into Israel. So, now, with that in mind, we go back to Revelation 12 and we're looking that she is clothed in regality with the Son. That's the ultimate authority, the victorious Messiah in view there, and wrapping Israel in her kingdom promises, the glory of the new covenant made with her that we will see fulfilled in Israel's future glory in the millennial reign. But she's not just clothed with the Son, she has the moon under her feet. That speaks of derived authority. Just how the moon gets its light from the Son, this is secondary authority. 
and that we are seeing when it's under her feet is symbolic of the old covenant, the, the original covenant, the reflected glory of it. See, the new covenant is the greater. So the new covenant is the light. The new covenant is the sun. The old covenant still was important, though, because God had made that original covenant with Israel, and he's going to fulfill it in the greater with the new covenant. So all authority, the the uh, the major and the minor, I'll put it that way, all authority is centered around this woman. When we move into Israel's promises and we look at the millennial reign, it's all, all authority is around Israel. Israel is the head nation. Right now it's the times of the Gentiles. Israel is not head nation. There's a Gentile nation that is the head. We'll see Gentile nations that are heading all the way through in the tribulation period. We see Jerusalem trodden underfoot by the Gentiles during the tribulation period. But when we finally cross over into millennium, this is when Israel is raised up. Okay, look with me at 2 Corinthians. I'm, I'm exercising your fingers in your scripture um, today. 2 Corinthians, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7 is talking about this new covenant. It actually talks about the old and the new. Okay, it says, But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moshe because of the glory of his face fading as it was. What, what's that saying? The law ministered death. The law didn't save anybody. The law condemns everybody. They couldn't be condemned without law because where there is no law, then you're not breaking the law. The law had to be in place to show that they could not live that holy, perfect life that they had to live to not be condemned by God. But, so that law was a ministry of death. It showed them they all are going to die. That law, we know, was the letters engraved on stone. God even wrote it with his own hand on the stone tablets. We know that. Even that which spoke death to the people, that came with glory. So much glory that when Moshe, as we talked about a moment ago, when he saw that which was left behind, as the Hebrew puts it, when he saw the glory of God that remained behind, it was it, it made his face a glow. The best way I can describe that from the Hebrew is take a um, light bulb. Don't put a shade over it. Take a light bulb. And don't do this for real, but you know in your mind I'm telling you it's right. If you flipped it on with no lampshade and you looked at it, it hurts your eyes. You turn that light bulb off, and there's still a glow for a few moments as that, that light diminishes. That's what remains behind. So when the glory of God passed by Moshe, he protects him in the cleft of the rock, but he has already passed by, and Moshe saw what was left behind. That's how brilliant and glorious our God is, that even that, that what's left behind, which is less vibrant than the reality, even that caused Moshe's face to glow. And yet that, in all its glory, was still ministering <laughs> death to them. <laughs> It's okay, sweetie. Front door opened. Okay. I didn't walk so, around. I would have missed a lot. <laughs> how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? If the ministry of, of the letters engraved on stones was this great, how much greater is the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit who writes that new covenant on our hearts, who engraves it in the heart of flesh? That's mm -hmm. so much greater. For the ministry of condemnation, the law, had glory, how much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory? For indeed, what had glory, in this case, has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. The new is so great, you're going to forget the old. It pales in comparison. There's no, well, this was good and this is gooder. No, this was fair and this was great and that's not even saying it good enough okay and I know my English was bad but there's no other way to put it for that which fades away was with glory much more that which remains is in glory the new covenant that glory remains forever that's what it's saying to us so we see the comparison but we see them both in relation with Israel here so we see the greater and the lesser are both speaking through and about Israel. It's not taking anything away from Israel. It's not replacing Israel. 
it all revolves around Israel. And she has a crown in verse 1 of chapter 12 back in Revelation. On her head is a crown. Crown speaks of dignity. Crown speaks of ruling. She has a crown that has 12 stars. We already saw the 12 stars. Stars are the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. And we read in the future, the 12 tribes of Israel will judge the earth. Here's wearing the mm -hmm. crown of glory. So we see that we're looking at Israel's governmental glory in the future. We're seeing her future millennial reign with the Messiah on the throne. Number 12 speaks of the fullness of government. We see that in Micha, Micah. Go to Micah, chapter 4. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't get my tablet to work. Micah, chapter 4, uh, verses 1 and 2. It will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and many, and the peoples will stream to it. Sorry. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Yaakov, the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion, from Zion, from Jerusalem, will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord, from Jerusalem. Those two verses let us know that there is a day coming when the mountain of the house of the Lord will be in Jerusalem. The nations will come up to the house of the God of Jacob, to Jerusalem. They'll come up to the temple to worship God, to be taught His ways, to walk in His paths, to receive his, the, the, the glory that, that will come from the word of the Lord. That's what we're seeing in Micah, Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Deuteronomy, Davarim, chapter 28. That one may be easier for you to find. It's the um, last of the first five books. You call it the Pentateuch. I call it the Torah, uh, which means instruction is God's instruction. Deuteronomy 28, verse 13. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You will be above and you will not be underneath. If you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which will charge you today to observe them carefully. Israel's being promised headship. She should have had it all along that when she did forget her God, was not obedient to her commandments, she instead found herself in the state she's even in still today, scattered among the nations and not the chief head nation. That we just read how God will bring her back, that it will be fulfilled even as he will keep his word to Abraham. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. I think you're very familiar with these verses. The Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. We have a lot in there. This is called the Abrahamic covenant. This is the covenant God made with Abraham. But what land did he send him to? He sent him to the land of Israel. He made that covenant with what we know to be called Israel today. That those who, um, that when he made his name great, it was in the land of Israel that he would receive blessing. And that those who touch Israel to curse her, the curse of God will come on her. Those who touch Israel will bless her will receive blessings from the Lord. We see that in small today where we will see that in huge in the future. But notice, did God ever intend to leave the rest of the world out? Did he say, I'm only going to bless Israel? No, he said, in you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. How can that be so? Well, Figuratively, we see it coming in the millennium when they will come up to Israel for blessings in their land. But I'll take you to the spiritual because there's more level to this than just one. This is the depth of scripture where if you just look at one layer, you're missing. It's like an onion that has layer after layer after layer. And when you get into this, how through Abraham is the whole world, all the earth blessed? How about through Abraham's seed? Who comes through? Abraham, Isaac. Jacob, David, Yeshua. That's how the whole earth is blessed, is through the seed of Abraham. It is through Yeshua, Jesus. That's where the fullness of this will come in and be completed. Um, 
Now, if we go back with all this background, all this Jewish thinking in our minds, and we continue to read in Revelation 12, we see that it fits very well to be the nation Israel. That is this great sign, this woman clothed with sun, the moon under her feet, had a crown of 12 stars, okay? Um, this is Israel in victory. When Israel is wearing the crown and clothed in glory, this is Israel in victory. Now, we're going to read verses 2 through 8 to show that something's happened. She's lost and she comes back to this great victory, okay? She is with child and she's crying out, being in labor and pain to give birth in verse 2. Okay, she's travailing in birth, she's in labor, but remember we know who she gives birth to. She gives birth to the male child who's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, the one who's been caught up to God and to his throne. We know that to be none other than Yeshua Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. But let's look at, her, at the foreshadowing of that. Go again back with me to Micah. Micha. I didn't remember I was going to go back or I would have told you to hold your place. Micah chapter 5 verses 2 and 3. Again, Scripture is very, very specific. Where it is, and it makes sense, we don't go looking for something else. Micha, Micah, chapter 5, verse 2 says, But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrata. Why do I say Scripture specific? I love it. There were two Bethlehems in Yeshua Jesus' day. One was called Bethlehem, Ephrata and the other was not. Out of the one called Bethlehem Ephrata, we just call it Bethlehem today, Beit Lechem, house of bread, by the way, too little among the clans of Judah. Okay, that means that it's in the territory of Judah, but it's a little tiny insignificant, we'll call it a peak and plum town. You peek around the corner, you plum out of town. This is a little insignificant dot on the map. Bethlehem is not a major city to be reckoned with. Too little to be to be among the clans of Judah. But what happens from you? One will go forth for me. One's going to go forth for God. This one who goes forth for God is to be the ruler in Israel. Does that sound like the one who's going to rule the nations? Yes, that's what it's saying. There will be a ruler that's going to rule the nations for God that comes from Beit Lechem, from Bethlehem, Ephrata. But there's something interesting about this one. It says, his goings forth are from long ago. When it's saying his goings forth, that's saying his, his, he's old. How do I say it nicely? He's old. He's been around. He's been going around for a long time, okay? How long has he been going around? From the days of eternity. Here is the proof that the son was given. The child was born. The child only lived about 33 years on the face of this earth. But the son goes all the way back to the days of eternity. And if it's talking about his <coughs> goings forth, where, did, where, when did he come from? It's talking about eternity past. This is proof that the one who comes to rule has to be God because only God comes from eternity past. Only God was the one before creation began. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And we know verse 14 of John, uh, Yochanan John 1, which I just quoted, says that He came, He dwelt among flesh. What it says in the Hebrew, and that's why I'm struggling with my English, He tabernacled with us. He sukkah. For those of you who just did the sukkah, he sukkah with us. And he tells us we come into his sukkah, into his provision for our eternal life. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. But here we go in Micha, and look at verse 3 also. Therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. We're seeing time that is going to be passing, okay? She's going to give birth to her child. The remainder of her brethren will finally return to the sons of Israel. They're not always going to be in right relationship with this one. That's what we see. Look at this one also from Yeshia, Isaiah 9, um, let's do 6 and 7. And again, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. I say it, Isaiah 
try to talk too fast. Yeshaya chapter 9 and verse 6. For a child will be born to us. Remember I just said that. The child is born. The child held in Miriam's arms had a point of beginning. The, the calendar as we know it today reflects around the time of his birth. Even though it's not accurate, we still say B.C., before Christ and A.D. in the year of our Lord after his birth. It's still relating to that time. The child is born, but the son was given because the son wasn't born. The son always existed. Remember, his goings forth are from eternity past. The government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. In our Hebrew, we have Pela Yaos, El Gabor, Avi Ad, Sar Shalom, all of this. I could spend a whole month the lessons on those names, what it's telling us. But it makes it very clear that this one is the one that we know as Almighty God, who is our Counselor, our Prince of Peace, our Eternal Father. Right there we have again, He comes from eternity. So much more that's in there. But we know who He is. And verse 7 tells us there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. Remember, it says the government's going to rest on his shoulders. That's the authority carrier. That's the place where they carry the authority. There'll be no end to his government or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, of, the, of Adonai Sabaoth, will accomplish this. We have the child that has been born, the son that has been given. We see him in the capacity of all of these names that he has, but do we see the government sit on his shoulders? Do we see it established? A government that is justice, a government that is righteous, do we see that anywhere on the face of this earth right now? Sadly, no. Even the best government is not just and right completely, and it's going to be from then on and forever. Again, in his second coming, he will put on that authority. He will bear it on his shoulders. He will sit on the throne. He will rule. He will reign, and it will be in justice and in righteousness, and it will go on forever. Okay. Question. Question, uh, yes. Yeah. Um. When she gives birth to the baby, is that when Israel comes back to God after she gives birth? To He's Jesus? asked. She's asking me when she gives birth to to Jesus. the baby, mm -hmm. chapter twelve. When she gives birth to the baby, is that when Israel comes back and is right with God? No, we're going to see that is actual timing. We're going to look at that. Um, I think I can get to that and show you in Revelation twelve before we stop for today. Before we go back, I'll look real quickly at Isaiah 7, 13 and 14. You were in 9, just turn back. 13 and 14. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David, David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Oh, by the way, remember, we've got a sign here in Revelation, and a sign means it is something miraculous. It is a wonder. It is something that, that's significant. Here's a sign that's going to be significant. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Now, the controversy even by our Jewish people today is they take this and they say that the Hebrew only says a young maiden will be with child and bear a son. Let me ask you, how miraculous is it that a young maiden gets pregnant and gives birth to a child. That happens all the time. That's not a sign. There are two words in the Hebrew, and the one that is used only for a virgin is the one that was used. The sign is that it was a virgin that conceived a miraculous birth, a God-given birth because he put the seed of God in, in the womb of woman. And she brings forth a son. Notice that ties in with chapter 12 of Revelation. His name called Emmanuel because it is God with us. Remember, he tabernacled with us. That's why that's the perfect name for him. On our way back to uh, Revelation, I want to stop off again at Romans 9. I don't remember if I read 4 and 5. If I did, we'll just summarize it. If I didn't, it's important that you hear it also here. Um, 
No, I don't think I did read it to us. Okay, Romans 9, we've been there. And we know that, that uh, Paul's talking about, well, verse 4, who are Israelites, okay? Um, he's talking about Yeshua, Jesus' uh, human flesh is Jewish, is what he's bringing out, that he's Israeli. The Israelites are his brethren, verse 3. They're his kinsmen according to the flesh, to whom belongs the adoption of sons. He is going to adopt them as his only son. He's given them the glory, or he's the glory, I'm sorry. He's given them the covenants, the giving of the law. I did read this. The temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Messiah, according to the flesh. So we did read through this before. Whose overall God bless forever. Amen. What I'm bringing out again is that Israel, the one who has the law, the one who has the temple service, the one who has the promises, the one who um, the fathers are, um, well, we know the fathers of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is who will give birth to the Messiah. That's what we're bringing out. So when we go back to the birth in Revelation, we know that now that woman is not just representing Miriam, because remember, she fled. She didn't flee to the wilderness. She fled in Egypt. She didn't flee for, uh, she fled for the sake of her child. She didn't flee for the sake of the nation. It wasn't for Is it wasn't Israel that fled for safety. She took the child for safety. So we see it doesn't fit being married. So it has to be Israel and there's nothing left. Israel gives birth, we see, is the flesh that brings forth this one that we call Messiah Yeshua Jesus. So. In essence, what we're saying now on our way back to Revelation 12, what we're saying is that Israel travailed and gave birth to Messiah. Now, we know literally Miriam did, but the nation of Israel is who Messiah, his birth comes from, from the nation. All her history was working to that point. God kept that line pure. He kept it right down to the fact that he did not let Miriam give birth in Nazareth. Now, why do I say that? Because if you look up your, your story that you're so familiar with, you will find Miriam and Joseph. Mary and Joseph were living in Nazareth. Nazareth is northern. Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. This is the days of camels and donkeys. This is not the day of Lear jets. It's not the day of a limousine. And it's not the day of any other easy travel. This was rough travel. Now, you've got a nine-month pregnant woman. Ask me any woman that you know in her ninth month about to give birth who would like to get on a donkey or get on a camel and start on a long journey, bump it along the way, and hope that she doesn't give birth in the middle oh, of no. nowhere. <laughs> and that would bring it on. All that and that would bring it on, yes. <laughs> so why in a, in, in a right mind would Miriam leave her home in Nazareth? Ah, because there was a decree that said you had to go back to where your family came from. Miriam's family didn't come from Nazareth. She's married to Yosef. Yosef's family didn't come from Nazareth. The family came from the house of David, from Bethlehem, Bethlehem. So they had to make that trek down to Bethlehem. Now let me ask you this. How often did those decrees come out? And give me a decree previous to this one that made everybody go back like that. Anybody come up with one in history? It's the only one. It's the only one. It was the first one of its kind. God moved on Cyrenius, or however you say his name, to put out the decree because he had to get a pregnant girl in Nazareth down to Beit Lechem. Why? Where did Micah, Micah, where did it say, I switched my Hebrew and English, where did it say that Messiah would be born in Nazareth? No, in Bethlehem, Ephrata. The Bethlehem that David came from. The Bethlehem that Miriam's family came from. The Bethlehem that means house of bread. Because who is the bread of life? Messiah. He had to be born in Bethlehem, and God gave a decree through a Gentile who had control over Israel to send Israel back to their roots to send Miriam in a pregnant condition down to Bethlehem. And, oh, by the way, the God who can orchestrate all that saw to it that the bumps on the road 
didn't cause her to give birth, to give birth. early. <laughs> she got all the way into Bethlehem. <laughs> but there's no room in the inn. Yeah. Now, come mm -hmm. on. God, this is your son being born. He's the son of God. He ought to be born in the palace. They should have been able to go to Herod's palace and say, the king, the future king is going to be born. We need the royal suite. That's what he deserved. But that's not what he did. He came lowly, he came humble, and he came for a purpose. As a suffering servant, but he also came as something else. And I want to get at that point. If you've been with me before, you'll know where I'm going. He couldn't even be born in the inn. He couldn't even be born in, in the houses around. He had to be born in a stinky stable. <laughs> he had to be born where animals are born. He had to be born in the barn. Let me ask you a question. Where are little sheep born? And I talked to an audience <laughs> once that one rose up and said, we had sheep. We know where the sheep were born. When mama's about to give birth, we don't even leave her out in the field. We bring her into the barn where she's safe. We make a nice area for her and we let her wait out her last, last time so that she might give birth in the safety of the barn, not out in the field where the predators are. So little sheep are born in the barn. What do we call the barn in scripture? The stable. Why was he born in the stable? Because he was born the Lamb of God who would give his life to take away the sin of the world. Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> and Pam had a little lamb. <laughs> <laughs> and she, he was born in the stable. Seth Ha Elohim the Lamb of God. Isn't God awesome? Isn't He amazing? Do you see the detail of His plan and how perfect? And oh, by the way, Micha, Micah, foretold that, oh, just a mere about 700 years before He was born. How would you like to forecast the birth of someone 700 years from now and tell me where they'll be born? and make it something that's not the norm. That's our God. The God of prophecy, if you've got nothing else, prophecy shows you an infallible, amazing, ineffable, I had to say it, God. <laughs> and I love it. Sidetrack, if I get anywhere near that, I have to bring that up, because that to me is so rich, so meaningful, and so fulfilling. So we are back. God has made the plan of history in relation to Israel. He, he planned to bring his son through Israel from the very beginning. He revealed that to those in the very beginning. He fulfills it in Israel. He has a future plan in Israel. That's why our story revolves around Israel. When people say, well, hey, why don't we read about the United States in Scripture? We've been a great country for 200 years and we were founded on godly principles. Why aren't we in Scripture? Because it's all about what related to Israel. It's all about Messiah in relation to Israel. It is his story, history in relation to Israel. Israel is the time clock of God. We have one story. We don't have old and new. The only way I want to hear old and new is when we're talking about the old, the original covenant and we're talking about the new covenant. But do not splice that book and say you've got the Jewish side and the Christian side. If you want to see me cringe, if you want to hear me get on my soapbox, say that in front of me. We have one story continual. It's the story of the Messiah who comes through the nation of Israel. That's what we have from start to finish through this book. And this is what we're seeing. Everything was working toward that moment in history, that pregnant moment, and it was a pregnant moment. And then everything looks back to that time. The history, the destiny of the people of Israel given all the way back when God promised Abraham all the nations of the world would be blessed, he was referring to the birth of Messiah in Israel. That is our God. God is committed 
to the survival of Israel. He is committed to the future glory of Israel. He is committed to bringing curse upon the nations that come against Israel. We will see that. He has kept his hand upon Israel through all of time because Satan has tried repeatedly through the years, through the centuries, through the ages to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And God has said, no, I made a plan with Israel. I made a promise to Israel. And the same way that he has fulfilled it to this point, he will fulfill the future. The future will hold Messiah sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, common Israel. And whether you like it or not, put an exclamation point after that sentence. God who said it, God will do it. We read that back here in Revelation 12, that this this child that she was with, she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. We read that this one, when we jump down to verse 5, will rule all the nations with a rod of iron. We read that right there, he is going to rule the world from Israel. Because the woman is Israel, this is where we are seeing. So this one, we know, is Israel. The woman is Israel. The birth is the man child. Let me give you just a tiny bit more. Why was she pained in delivery? Just because women have labor pain? No. In fact, some women are fortunate if they don't have much. But Israel was in pain. When the Messiah was born, she was suffering under Roman dominion. Yeah. She was not free to live the life the way she wanted. That's why a Jewish girl pregnant in Nazareth is being forced down to Bethlehem because it was a, the decree given out by Rome. Rome decreed it. I skipped the whole part for you. Yes, yes, and the, the killing of the firstborn. Yes, we're going to see all of that is because Israel was not sitting on the throne. Israel was not in control of her own future. She was not in a right place with God. Um, let me show you Luke 1, and I realized I left something out. You know what, I'll pick it up in verse 5 because I'm trying to tie it up. Um, go with me real quick, though. Go to, um, what did I just say? To Luke 1. Luke 1. Chapter, chapter 1, verse 68. Luke 1, 68. Luke 1, 68 says to us... i got to keep scrolling. There we go. Luke 1, 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us, accomplished redemption for his people, has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, David, his servant. Um, how far do I want to read? I'll take you through 71. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father. Have we just gone full circle reading that? Yes, we just have. Do you catch all of that? Blessed be the God of Israel. He's visited us. How did the God of Israel visit us? In Messiah. He accomplished redemption for his people. Messiah shed his blood for redemption. He is the horn of our salvation raised up. It came in the house of David. David was a picture of, the, of being his servant. Messiah came as a servant. The holy prophets spoke that. They told the salvation from our enemies, deliverance from our enemies that we would be saved from the hand of all who hate us. Do you not see that? How many times has Satan tried? We're going to look right here at how he tried to kill the, the male babies. But we know that he tried to kill them many a time through history. The most recent Holocaust, the Crusaders. I can go back through time and time and time where we see the vendetta against the Jews. That God had mercy. Mercy toward our fathers. Our fathers remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. To remember God's holy covenant. Remember, he keeps covenant, he fulfills covenant. And the oath that he swore to Abraham, that is what he is fulfilling by bringing Messiah first time and returning Messiah second time. Where? To Utah? To somewhere else? No, to Jerusalem. And what Jerusalem? Jerusalem, comma, Israel. Jerusalem should never be divided. It is the eternal capital of the holy city of God in Israel. Should it be divided, and I believe it will be, I believe it will be divided at the hands of the Antichrist, Daniel 11 being fulfilled during the tribulation period. I hope it does not happen prior to that time, 
but I, I know it's not at the hand of God, and God will overrule and bring it back. Jerusalem will be the eternal capital of Israel. Okay, so um, what I did not bring out that I'll bring out next week, when we get down to verse 5, because we're going to read, you know, what, what's here. We're, we're looking just at the women, so we won't say a whole lot about 3 and 4, but it will come into play when we get down to verse 9. So hang tight as I jump around a little bit in this chapter. But what we're going to see, this ruling of the nations with a rod of iron, we're going to see that also is fulfillment of prophecy. But what we're saying is that this child, the child that was born, the son that was given, has authority, authority to rule the entire world. We know who that belongs to, but we're going to see the rod in his hand. So we'll look at some of the uh, original covenant scriptures that refer to this. We'll see that it's being fulfilled in the future. We'll continue on here next week with um, the fact that the, that uh, she gave birth. We've talked about that. We know that it was Messiah that was given birth. So we'll pick up probably at verse 5, the ruling of the nations with the rod of iron. I'll explain the, the scriptures with that. Then we will continue on and we'll see what happens with this woman. We're going to look at chapter 12 in reference to the woman. Okay? So we're going to see that she's going to flee. We'll talk about when. We'll talk about where. We're going to see that there's a war going on in heaven that is that has to do with what happens to her also. So we'll see that. Uh, because we're going to look at that, I'll even take you all the way through. I think that I will go ahead because I think you need it for the complete thought. We know this one who comes against him is the one called the dragon. We will look at the dragon's demise. And we will see, we talked about, I think just last week, we talked about how Satan has not yet received his full just deserts, his, his reward for his acts. We see that there's a time when he's allowed into the very presence of God in heaven to accuse the brethren. We'll talk about whether that's being allowed today. We'll talk about when is he kicked out of heaven. He comes down in four stages before the fourth stage of his eternity in hell. We'll look at the four stages of his fall, when and how and where. We'll look at that as much as scripture tells us in relation, again, to Israel because that is who is his pet peeve. So when we study the woman, we have to study the one who comes against the woman. But greater is the one who she gave birth to who will protect her and fulfill his promises to her. So we'll go through all that next week. Um, it sounds like a lot, but I think we can easily go through it next week. And uh, we'll touch on who the dragon is in the midst of that. So once we've gone through next week, then we'll be ready for our order of the final events. We've looked at all the key players. We'll bring out Armageddon and what happens after Armageddon in the timeline of God. Because that's what this original study was about. The key players in the tribulation and then the timeline from the end of the tribulation forward until we come into eternity future. Okay? I threw a lot at you. I threw it fast. I hope I didn't just make a mishmash out of it. Are there any questions? When you said the in Matthew 27? Yes. The opening of the graves? Yes. You were saying that Christ had risen? I thought he was on the cross. Right? He was on the cross when the earthquake happened. Yeah. And the graves were split right. open. But they didn't come out of the graves until so after, after he was he resurrected. Was resurrected. Uh -huh. not, not ascended in heaven. Resurrected. Matthew 27 <laughs> makes that clear. Let's look back real quick. And they think that might be the old time yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. and out of uh, pair, uh, That's where I got confused. Sign. Some believe the Old Testament saints all were resurrected at that time. I don't believe it was all of them at that time. I believe that's in our rapture as we've talked about. But Matthew 27, where, where was it? It was way down there. Um, okay. Okay. Um, in 52, it's in 52. And the right. broke open the bodies of many holy people. Who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection they entered the holy city they came out of the after after yes, his resurrection yeah. yeah so even though they were split open it showed the the move of god 
okay. that open them, but they didn't come out until after. That's verse um, 53. 53. 53. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. because Messiah had to be the first. So he had to, to be rise. raised after from the Jesus dead first. Raised. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then these others. He came out of the tombs after Jesus. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah, little detail. Thank you. Little detail. All those little words in Scripture. Yeah. Like I say, Bethlehem, Ephrata. It didn't even just leave it with Bethlehem where they could guess which two. And by the way, for any who want to claim to be Messiah today, and there is a group who follows someone who has died, who they thought would be resurrected, the first question that I would ask if I were confronting would be, where was he born? Was he born in Bethlehem, Ephrata? And the answer to that question is no. This one was born in Brooklyn, New York. So those of you who are in the know know who I'm talking about now. I just well, offended a lot of my Jewish people. But we've got to look at the truth of Scripture. Every word counts. And yes, in this case, the word after was critically important. Do you believe that trumpets in the... He's home. Has there already been... Like Isaiah... Oh, the revived Cyrus? Is that what you're talking about, where they're talking, they're comparing him to Cyrus? I don't know. I keep hearing from a certain person that Trump is in, has already been predicted like Christ was, you know, years ago. And I'm thinking. Okay, no, I no. think what they're referring to, she's saying that somebody's <laughs> making this comment about Trump, um, that, that they're saying he's like resurrected. I think what they're saying. They have compared him to Cyrus, who I've written yeah. about, yes. Mm -hmm. because he's Cyrus, the Antichrist. <laughs> Cyrus is the one who, um, the decree went out for the rebuilding of, of the right. Israel, where our timeline counted down to Messiah coming. Cyrus was named in scripture 150 years before he was born. God said that he was going to raise up Cyrus, who would do this. So when they saw Trump mm -hmm. move the embassy to Jerusalem, which recognized the eternal capital of Israel, they said, oh, he's like Cyrus. He's he from the hand of God. He was predicted. He's the one who has done this. Well, it falls apart with what your prediction you're trying to say. Did God raise up Trump and use Trump to have us recognize Israel as, I mean, Jerusalem as eternal capital? Yes. Absolutely. God raises up leaders. Yeah, he brings he them down. He yeah. uses them for his purposes. He did put Trump in at this time to do what Trump did. Whether Trump's aware of that or not doesn't matter. It's yeah. that God is in control. Does yeah. that make Trump a reincarnation? No. No, not at all. Was Trump named in Scripture? No. Those who jump and take this and say, so see, he's going to be the Antichrist? No. Okay? It doesn't fit. He's not in the area where he needs to make a peace treaty with Israel. Oh, but he's making the peace treaty. No, he's not. He may have been, have been part of drawing up on papers, but the ones that make the peace treaty are the Arabs and the Israelis. They're the ones who are at war with each other. The U.S. And, the, and Israel are so tight that we've got our men in their military and their men in our military. The Iron Dome that has saved so many lives in Israel here in recent years, two of them were just sent to the United States a week ago maybe it's a little longer, in this last month, okay, for the protection of the U.S. soldiers who are going off in battle, okay? We're sharing. That's wonderful. God's hand is at work. God raises up leaders. God brings them down. So, no, the only thing, and, and they're doing a, a coin comparison because we have coins that had Cyrus's um, picture on it because they, they, they were those who thought he was like a god. And there are those who are trying to say that of Trump now. The coins that you see feed an ego. That's all they do. And if they do sign the peace treaty, they won't keep it. They have broken it year, every time. They and, won't keep well, it. Well, I, I didn't believe it, but I mean... Right, right. It it's that like, they get carried away. So. What you have to remember, and I, I know I've got to close, or at least close in prayer and let people go who want to go, but what you need to keep in mind, because there's a lot out there that read the United States into prophecy, okay? I'm not calling out names, and I am not God, and I am not perfect, and I pray for God that anything I say wrong, you don't hear wrong, that the Lord turn it in your ears. But 
What you need to remember is those prophecies are given in relation to Israel. They're not given in relation to the United States. So when you compare those prophecies to 9-11, the World Trade Center's falling, and, and the, the eerie things that we're seeing and done, I could say key words that I'm purposely not saying, but if you've read these books, if you listen to these speakers, you know, they go in and they read what God said for Israel, and they're applying it to the United States. Yes. Well, that's replacement theology. Yes. That's saying that God's taken it away from Israel and He's given it to the U.S. Yes. That's not true. Yes. Now, can there be comparisons? Yes. Can we apply and learn lessons that God taught Israel for ourselves? Yes. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with applying, but there's everything wrong with taking it from who it is meant for and giving it, it to, to someone, someone else. else. That's what we cannot do. Yeah. When God promised yeah. Israel that Messiah would sit on the throne in Israel, he's going to sit on the throne in Israel. He's going to fulfill that in Israel. And he may use the United States to strengthen Israel or to be the first to recognize that capital or whatever, but that does not mean that he's taken that and given that to the United States. No, that's not what's being said. So we have to be very, very careful. Let me give you the blood moons real fast. Now, I'm not going into all the description, but the, the year that so much was supposed to happen, which has come and gone, by the way, and they referred to these blood moons, and they got all excited with the first one. Here's the first one, and they were so excited over it. It was not original thought with me, but boy, it sure rang true in my spirit. That very first blood moon could not even be seen in Israel because at the time, it was day over there when it was happening here in the United States. Now, if it's to be a sign for Israel, don't you think Israel ought to be able to see it? Don't you think it ought to be happening in Israel sky and not in the U.S. sky? You know, I love my United States. I'm loyal to my United States. But it is not my Israel. And it is not what God has promised for Israel. So we have to be very, very careful. We get all excited and we can read a lot in. And that's where we come up with 88 reasons why the Lord would return in 1988. Well, <laughs> that book yeah. went down in a lot of the LNG the flame, okay? <laughs> we need to be very careful. Can we apply lessons? Yes, but leave the original intact. What God said to Israel will happen to Israel. What God says for other countries will happen for other countries. So I got to get off my soapbox. I saw the clock. I've got to stop. But I think that end was really critical. I hope that everybody catches that because there's a lot of teaching out there that will lead you down the path deceitfully where you will fall into replacement theology without even realizing it and start preaching parts of it yourself if you don't stay true to the Word of God. Remember, the whole Word of God is for us, but not the whole Word of God to us. Okay? There are books that are to the church age. There are books that are to the time of the tribulation. Books that are, are to, you know, God's different times. Everything's for us. We read it cover to cover. We learn from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, 16, whatever the last verse is. 18, I don't remember. Anyway, the last verse. But notice in that end also, don't add to, don't take away. So just keep it pure in its original and then apply the lessons as God applies them to your heart. Okay? Yes, Roger. Um, it's true that most of the pastors that come up seminaries and stuff like that are learning replacement theology. A lot of our seminaries do teach replacement theology. It grieves my heart, but it's true. It is true. Um, if I told you names, if I told you denominations, if I told you... <coughs> A lot of you would be blown away, you'd be mortified because you're in that not realizing it. Does everybody teach that? No. Okay? So don't hear me wrong. Just because you go to that seminary or because you're in a church that's connected in that denomination doesn't mean that your pastor or you are teaching and believing that. It doesn't mean that. But sadly, coming out of seminary today, they're not being taught God has a program with Israel and he will fulfill that program with Israel. God has a program for the, the church age, the age of grace, and he will fulfill it. God has one program for salvation. 
No dual covenant. That's another lie, okay? No dual covenant. God doesn't say Israel gets saved this way and the church gets saved this way. No. One name under heaven whereby we must be saved. The name Yeshua in Hebrew, Jesus in English. That's it. One way of salvation. That's critical. If you're not in a church that preaches salvation only by Jesus and Jesus only, get out of it. Okay? But if it is, and there's something else that, that's different, depending on how much, how bad they go into it, don't let it throw you. There's no perfect church. Rochelle's not perfect. Your pastors aren't perfect. But they need to, we need to stay as close as we can to the Word of God and pray for the Ruach HaKodesh and the Holy Spirit to teach us, to enlighten us and for truth to be spoken. But the teaching is prevalent even in good seminaries that put out pastors who are in good churches, but they're not good if they teach replacement theology. Mm -hmm. Okay? I think after the rapture, I don't think America will even be around. I think America is imploding now, and you take the believers it's out. It's already lining up for that right you, now. And you take the believers out. This past yeah, year has so. so changed the face of America. Yes. It can easily slide they don't into honor the flag. nothing important they don't to honor replace, anything. To, uh, to bring into the program of the tribulation as we read it in Revelation. Very That's easy. Right. Very easy. Yeah, God's hand on, on America, I believe, is only because of his believers here. You take us out, we look out. I wouldn't want to be here. Okay. No police Questions, no comments? Do we close in prayer first? I think they're muted again. They got muted again. Okay. Yeah, well, let's close in prayer while you're muted and then we will open it. I'm I so apologize for the time. I tried hard, it's why I talked fast. <laughs> Lord God, thank you. We trust that truth has been spoken here. What has been, Lord, burn it into our hearts and our minds. Let us have the understanding from the Ruach HaKodesh, from the Holy Spirit. Let us retain it. Let us see scripture from its truth. Lord, let us learn. Let us learn lessons from Israel. Let us learn from all. But let us realize that you, in your master plan, keep your word. You are faithful. You are true. And what you say you will do, that no one thwarts your plan. There is no plan B and there is no backup. Change nothing. What you say stands past, present, future. Hallelujah. On that alone, we are secure in our salvation. And we praise and we thank you for this. And that one day soon, we will be home with you. And then we too will know when we have question marks now. But Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness your faithfulness to Israel, but we also thank you for your faithfulness to the body of Messiah, to the church age, to the age of grace, and how we long to bring many more in before we go home. So Lord, send us out. Let us bring the sheaves in. Let us bring in a harvest of souls. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, questions, comments?